Hello and welcome everybody. I am Lalita Duperon. I'm the Associate Director in the Center for South Asia at Stanford and thank you all for being here uh, today. Um, we have lots and lots of programming in the pipeline and if you want to stay um, on top of everything we're doing, please uh, sign up for our mailing list. You can do that on our website and also please follow us on social media. Uh, before I hand over to our moderator of today, uh, who will introduce our speaker, I just want to um, recognize that Stanford is an occupier of the ancestral and unceded land of the Mawikma Ohlone tribe. We are grateful to be guests on this land and commit to solidarity to indigenous struggles. The land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. And consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to honor and make visible the university's relationship to indigenous peoples. And now I would uh, invite my friend and colleague, Professor Part Shield from the History Department to take over. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lalita. Uh, it is my tremendous pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Shigata Bos and welcome him today. Uh, Professor Bose needs no introduction at a South Asia Center seminar because almost every student and researcher of South Asian history and politics would be familiar with his work. But let me make an attempt to briefly introduce him to our audience today. Uh, Professor Bose is the Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University. He trained as an historian of modern South Asia at Presidency College, Calcutta, and did his doctoral work at University of Cambridge. Before joining Harvard, he was a fellow at St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, and professor of history and diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, though it will take far too long for me to mention all of Professor Bose's extensive writings and the sheer breadth of research areas to which he has made major contributions, but let me mention a few. Professor Bose is the author of Agrarian Bengal, Economy, Social Structure and Politics, 1919 to 1947. A Hundred Horizons, The Indian Ocean in the Age of Global Empire, His Majesty's Opponent, Subhash Chandra Bose and India's Struggle Against Empire, and The Nation as Mother and Other Visions of Nationhood. Today, Professor Bose has very kindly agreed to present to us a part of a monograph he's currently writing entitled Asia After Europe, and his lecture is entitled In Search of Young Asia. With a lot of excitement, I now invite Professor Bose to begin his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Parth. Um, uh, I um, am delighted to be virtually on the West Coast, and it is, in fact, necessary um, in order to embark on a voyage across the Pacific with uh, Binay Kumar Sharkar. So let me uh, quickly uh, share my screen uh, with you to show you a few pictures. So here we go. On a warm day in June 1915, Binay Kumar Sharkar waited in his hotel lobby in Tokyo for Yone Noguchi, professor of English literature at Keio University. The poet Noguchi had spent six months in England during 1914, being celebrated by the literati in London and Oxford. Sarkar noted that the English had engaged in a similar craze, Matamati, with Robi Babu, Rabindranath Tagore, the year before. Sarkar set off with Noguchi by tram and then train to his village home, some 17 or 18 miles outside the capital. The poet's wooden cottage in the midst of a forest and fields looked like a kakimono work of art. His study, and an adjoining room for guests had Japanese paintings on the walls, while the bookshelves contained works of English poetry and criticism. Sarkar noticed a photograph of the English poet laureate Robert Bridges, 
a handwritten congratulatory message from W.B. Yeats and a small bust of Francis Thompson. Sarkar learned that Noguchi had received a letter from Rabindranath Tagore saying that he would be visiting Japan soon and that the main purpose of his visit would be to have conversations about Japanese literature and art. Sarkar thought Indians should be aware that Noguchi could partially fill the void left by Okakura's passing, even though he was not a profound philosopher. The way Noguchi had articulated the inner meaning of Japanese literature in the spirit of Japanese poetry had convinced him that the art critic Okakura and the literary critic Noguchi belonged to the same intellectual family. Gordon Lewis Dickinson in his book Appearances had got Japan quite wrong in Sarkar's view, having been misled by the sight of some banks and shops, electric lights and train stations, a few professors and businessmen in hats and coats into portraying the whole of Japan as Euro-America's Mufasil. In order to understand the true Japan, it was necessary to find interpreters like Noguchi and to independently view the interior and exterior of Japanese society with eyes open. Sarkar quoted two poems, The Poet and The Lotus, from Noguchi's collection, Pilgrimages. The Lotus revealed his introspective nature. The one lotus whiter than prayer, before me rose fall as a dream, with the sunlight fallen through the clouds, the flower smiled the sorrow of heaven. This sounded to Sarkar like the melody of Gitanjali. Sarkar could hear in Noguchi the voice of the new Japan that had not lost its originality under the influence of Euro-America. Even in the 20th century, Sarkar saw Japan to be part of the Indian universe, Bharat Mandal, and Noguchi as born of the same mother as Rabindranath. Gitanjali and pilgrimages, he proclaimed, are excavations from the same mine. This was not, however, the only melody of the inhabitants of Asia. Other tunes were also Asia's own, and Sarkar did not want those to be lost from view. Noguchi's wife brought tea. Have you read Okakura's Book of Tea? The poet asked. A Japanese dinner featuring fish, cooked rather than raw, followed. By the time Sarkar bid goodbye to Noguchi and his wife, the moon had risen in a cloud-capped sky. Born in 1887, Binay Kumar Sharkar was a brilliant student who read history and literature at Presidency College, Calcutta. As a young man, he enthusiastically joined the Swadeshi movement in 1905 and played an innovative role in mass mobilization in his home district of Malda. By reinterpreting a local performative musical tradition named Gumbhira, he was able to connect a folk element to the imagination of the Bengali and by extension, Indian nation, as Oniket De has shown in his new book, The Boundary of Laughter. He emerged as one of the finest examples of the colorful cosmopolitan rooted in local learning and patriotic activism while embarking on a global intellectual quest. In 1914, he traveled to Egypt, Ireland, and England, and then boarded the Philadelphia in November to cross the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York. Lala Lajpat Rai, the preeminent leader of the Swadeshi movement in the Punjab, and the renowned scientist Jagadish Chandra Bose and his wife Abola were fellow passengers on the transatlantic voyage. The ship was also the venue of his meeting with a young Austrian woman, Ida Stieler, who he would marry in November 1922. After half a year in the United States, he embarked on his Pacific crossing and arrived in Japan on a ship named Tanyo Maru from Honolulu in early June 1915. 
Binay Kumar Sharkar's major English works have been receiving belated scholarly attention from historians. His travel writings in Bengali, by contrast, have remained neglected, even though they are arguably the best sources for understanding the affective bond forged with an entity called Asia. In 1915-16, Sarkar spent three months in Japan and nearly 10 months in China. His essays on Japan were published during those years in journals before appearing as a book titled Nobineshiar John Modata Japan, The Birth Giver of Young Asia Japan in 1923. By 1923, Tokyo was no longer the only capital of free Asia. Ankara was also a new center of this freedom. To Japan went the credit of being the Dikha Data, giver of initiation, and Shikha Guru, mentor of young India, young China, young Afghanistan, young Iran, and young Egypt. On the 10 day voyage across the Pacific, Sarkar noticed the distance between American and Japanese passengers, many of whom returning from the World Fair in San Francisco. On arrival in Japan, he launched into a systematic study tour of all aspects of Japanese life, its social customs, and learned institutions based on varied interactions with its prominent and ordinary citizens. His writings formed the intellectual basis for interreferential political and revolutionary action across Young Asia at a moment of European imperial crisis. If the Swadeshi links were primarily cultural, suffused with an anti-colonial spirit, World War I afforded the opportunity for youthful daring on both intellectual and political planes. The first institution on Sarkar's itinerary was Tokyo Imperial University, where he visited the library and museum. Sarkar had already met Tokyo's professor of Buddhist literature, Masaharu Anesaki, at Harvard, where in his role as visiting professor, he had been busy propagating the peace-loving credentials of Japan. By Bharat Varsha, the land of India, the Japanese understood the entire Bharat Mandal, Indian universe, including Siam, Burma, Indochina, Persia, Java, and Sumatra. Steering clear of politics so as not to offend the British, eminent Japanese citizens were keen to learn about India. After visits to the War Museum and the Art Museum in Ueno Park, Sarkar took in Ginza, which with its department stores, Mitsukoshi and Maruzen and Big Banks, could be regarded as Tokyo's Chorangi, Calcutta's main thoroughfare. Sarkar believed he discovered the true identity of the Japanese, in their handicrafts, cottage industries, and family-based businesses. A visit to the editorial office of Koka provided the occasion for conversation about art. The editor, Seichi Taki, taught art history at Tokyo University. Sarkar saw Nandalal Bose's painting Koikei, a Ramayana character, on Taki's wall. A few works of Abhinindranath Tagore and Nandalal Bose had been featured in an issue of the magazine a few years ago. Under Okakura's influence, according to Taki, young Japan had these days become admirers of the new Indian art, and some were even imitating Abunindranath's artistic style. Taki himself found modern Indian art to be too soft and feminine, but praised the Indian artist's command of lines and sense of color. Sharkar was taken to the performance of No plays by Noguchi and described No as Japanese Gombira, in sharp contrast to Dickinson's analogy with Greek drama. Preaching morals and theorizing on quotidian life through plenty of satire and humor were the hallmarks of both genres. At a Tuesday evening gathering of writers, Sharkar found that the impending visit of Tagore had created quite a stir. The Japanese translation of Sadhana, based on Tagore's 1913 lectures at Harvard, 
had sold thousands of copies. The Japanese did not appreciate the Nobel winning Gitanjali as much. At another venue, Sarkar met Hattori Unokichi, a scholar of Chinese philosophy and literature who had spent time at Peking University and was poised to go to Harvard in place of Anisaki. Sarkar wondered whether James Horton Woods's plans to bring professors from India to Harvard would bear any fruit. Sarkar noted that the venerable prime minister, Okawa Shigenobu, had emphasized education in his mother tongue when he founded Waseda University. At the same time, Waseda had appointed to its faculty Subochi, a translator of Shakespeare into Japanese, with whom Sarkar discussed education and literature. Sarkar observed the high standing of three elders in Japanese society, Okuma, Nitobe, the author of Bushido, and, and Baron Shibusawa Eiichi, the captain of finance and industry. Having encountered him at a meeting of the Japanese Association Concordia, Sarkar sought out Shibusawa for an interview in his office. He learned that the restructuring of banking and finance had been the first step in the economic modernization of Japan. Indians needed to come to Japan, in Sarkar's opinion, only to see that it was possible to accept work patterns of Euro-America without adopting Euro-American heirs. Once he ventured out of Tokyo, Sarkar identified even more similarities between Japan and India. In the streets, hotels, and markets of Tokyo, Nikko, Matsushima, and Sapporo, he looked upon Japanese men and women in the same way as he had seen Marathi speakers in the streets of Pune. In Japan, he had come to truly appreciate that despite the difference of language, unity was deeply implanted in the heart of Asia. The politeness and dignity that he saw among the Japanese and Muslims were the products of, quote, a thousand year long Asiatic custom and practice, unquote. The discovery of similarity in difference continued once an 11 hour journey brought him from Tokyo to Kyoto, Japan's Delhi, with its 17th century Kano art and the Nishihonganji Buddhist temple. Upon arriving in Nara, the Sarnath of Japanese Buddhism, Sarkar wondered, was there no difference between 8th century Japan and India? It was only the site of factories and municipality of Osaka that led Sarkar to deploy an English analogy. Asia's Manchester. But even in its vicinity, he found occasion to spend a night at a Buddhist monastery being run by a young Japanese scholar who had visited the explorer of Tibet, Sharat Chandra Das, in Darjeeling. By mid August 1915, Sarkar mused, What have I seen in Japan? His reflections in answer to that question underscore a dramatic contrast between his travel experiences in Asia and Euro-America. In England and America, I understood the language of the people. I could converse with them in their mother tongue. Yet I felt oddly out of place, kapchara was the Bengali word, in those societies. They too were unable to accept me as one of their own. I have not understood the language of the men and women of Japan, Yet standing on any street in any city or village, I have felt as if I have been watching the scenes of Calcutta. In their gait and look, their posture, their manner of speech, their laughter and humor, their modest and respectful demeanor, their customs of greeting and serving guests, in all these matters, I have found India. In its heart and mind, Japan is a part of Asia, it has only imported some scraps of iron from Euro-America. Now, Sharkar was admitted into the circle of scholars and artists in New York and Boston during 1914, 1915, and 1917, 1919. Yet, it was his feeling oddly out of place, recorded candidly in his Bengali writing, that was depicted in Florin Stettheimer's oil painting, Studio Party or Soiree. In it, Sarkar's still figure 
is placed as an exotic fig leaf in front of Florine's nude self-portrait on the wall of her studio, the venue of an animated avant-garde soiree. The awkwardness of Sarkar's pose, Mani, Manu Goswami has commented in her excellent article in Asia, belies the centrality of his placement. For Sarkar, it was not a pose. He felt awkward or kapchala in this milieu. The intellectual engagement with Euro-America and the effective bond with Asia represented distinct modes of internationalist belonging of a colonized Indian intent on shaping a global future. A 26 hour journey from Osaka to Fusan marked the transition from Japan's Janmo Bhumi, homeland or land of birth to Bhog Bhumi, land possessed. Sarkar had arrived once more in unfree Asia. He feared that Korea would suffer the fate of Ireland as a colony next door and reckoned Japan might face a Korean problem, much like England's Irish problem. From Korea, Sarkar went to Manchuria to see for himself Mukden and Port Arthur, venues of battles in 1904-1905, won by General Nogi and Admiral Togo. In Port Arthur, he met Count Otani, who held a lengthy discussion with him on the land routes and sea lanes along which Buddhism had spread from South to East Asia. But it was 1905 as a temporal threshold in modern history that enchanted the Indian visitor much more. In a final chapter titled Bande Port Arthuram, he wrote that the one who had proclaimed the East is East and the West is West was blinded by an awful superstition. Port Arthur had brought home the clear realization that this mark of difference was a matter of only one century. Before the 19th century, Sarkar asserted, concepts such as East and West had no currency in human society. The traveler closed with a ringing proclamation about the future. Having acquired new knowledge, the people of Asia will once again stride the world as human beings within the 20th century. The way in which Prachamanob, human beings of the East, excelled in secular life by productively engaged with the interplay of Vishashokti, world forces, until the 16th and 17th centuries, indicated they will regain that high status from the 21st century. The 522-mile journey from Mukden to Peking was made in 22 hours. What struck Sarkar on his arrival was China's Duddasha, misfortune. Everywhere he could see the domination of the foreigner. As in Japan, he proceeded to keep a record of his trip in Bengali and published some of it in the form of articles. The travelogue was completed in its entirety by June 1916 and published in full as a book titled Bottomanjuge Chin Shamrajo the Chinese Empire in the Present Age in 1921. He dedicated the book to Kang Yu Wei and Liang Qiqiao, who deserved, according to him, the reverence of Yang Asia. Residing in a hotel run by Westerners in the legation quarter of Peking, Sarkar went for dinner at a Chinese Muslim restaurant. He noted that there were as many as 20,000 Muslim families in Peking. He visited the main mosque, where as soon as he pronounced La ilaha illallah, Chinese voices completed the affirmation with Muhammadu Rasulallah. The Sanskrit language, Devanagari script, and an image of Buddha in a 14th century inscription near the Great Wall naturally thrilled Sarkar. The whole of Asia, he wrote, must become the domain of enquiry for Indian historians. Among the Chinese intellectuals Sarkar met in Beijing was Yan Fu, who had studied in Cambridge and translated Herbert Spencer and Adam Smith into Chinese. Another day, the Edinburgh educated author of The Spirit of the Chinese People, Gu Hong Ming, sought Sarkar out in his hotel and held an extended conversation on Confucianism. 
unlike a handful of other Indian visitors who tended to limit themselves to coastal cities, Sarkar traveled into the rural interior of China. He set off by train from Peking for the 300 mile journey to Henan province. The linguistic difference seemed to be of little con consequence. If Bengalis of Calcutta could regard the Marathas of Pune and the Tamils of Madurai as their brothers, why should they not call Chinese their brothers as well? He concluded, the whole of Asia is one. If one is to disbelieve the unity of Asia, one would first have to lose faith in the unity of India. Yet, Sarkar was not a proponent of a unitary state, either in China or in India. The existence of multiple European states took nothing away from the fundamental unity that underpinned the idea of Europe. China, he believed, was pursuing the mirage of so-called unification and would be much better off as a conglomeration of a number of independent provinces. A federal India and a federal China, Sarkar seemed to argue, could happily reside in a unified concept of Asia. After surveying the Bharat Mandal crafted by Indian and Chinese pilgrim scholars in Henan, Sarkar departed for the neighboring Hubei province. Once the train crossed the hilly terrain of the Henan-Hubei border, the fishermen's boats and peasant cottages were reminiscent for Sarkar of the scenes of East Bengal. On reaching the city of Hankou, modern-day Wuhan, some 750 miles southwest of Beijing, that idyll was broken. Sikh policemen were to be seen in the British concession. It was evident to Sarkar that the Chinese public suffered oppression at their hands. Wherever in China there were neighborhoods based on foreign concessions, Sarkar found there was some degree of resentment against Indians. Sarkar chose to return east by steamer down the great Yangtze River. It took two days to reach Nanjing. Continuing to observe the vastness of China's landscape, Sarkar reached his destination, Shanghai, which he found more glittering than Calcutta or Bombay. Sarkar met Tang Shao Yi, a thoroughly modern man, who told him in unequivocal terms that it was the duty of every Asian to safeguard the glory of Asia. Tang Shao Yi had visited India for eight months in 1904 as a plenipotentiary of the Qing government and saw many commonalities between the societies of Bengal and South China. Sarkar then settled down for a seven month stay at Shanghai. At a Saturday gathering at an elite Shanghai club, Sarkar encountered Wu Ting Fang, the witty author of America Through the Eyes of an Oriental a Diplomat, who inquired about theosophy and expressed a desire to visit Madras at war's end. Wu Ting Fang wrote the introduction to Sarkar's book, Chinese Religion Through Hindu Eyes, a study in the tendencies of Asiatic mentality, the product of his research in Shanghai. Neither historically nor philosophically, Sarkar stated in the opening paragraph, does Asiatic mentality differ from the Euro-American. Only after the industrial revolution of the 19th century had the alleged difference been broached and then grossly exaggerated. The pseudo-scientific theories or fancies regarding race, religion, and culture that vitiated the present were unknown to the world down to the second or third decade of the 19th century. This was Sarkar's opening salvo in the devastating critique of the comparative method of Orientalism that would be the hallmark of his scholarly works in subsequent years. To contest the hubris of European Orientalism, Sarkar called for a new movement of educated Indians to travel and reside abroad. He rejected the sweeping claims made by Lewis Dickinson in appearances and Herbert Giles in his Hibbert lectures titled Confucianism and its Rivals that the Hindus were steeped in religion while the Chinese were not. He contended 
that an idea of Asiatic unity was encapsulated in the Japanese term Sangoku, which was rendered in English as Concert of Asia. Scholars had yet to learn that Asiatic history was as dynamic and as good a record of changes as the history of Europe. For insights into the psychology of intimacy ev evoked in early 20th century Asian encounters, one must fall back on Sarkar's Bengali travel writing rather than his erudite scholarship in English. Perhaps most fascinating was what Sarkar had to say about Chinese Muslims and the role of Islam in undergirding Asian unity. Theorizing on this subject had come a long way from Okakura's emphasis on the Buddhist arc. Sarkar felt a closer affinity to Chinese Muslim society than Chinese Buddhist society. In Japan and China, he had seen Buddhists and understood their historical relationship with India. But the music that sprang from my heartstrings as soon as I encountered Muslims here, he wondered, why did it not sound on the same strings when I met the Chinese and Japanese Buddhist worshippers of Shakko Shingo? Muslims have kept Asia truly united, Sarkar observed, by tying this thread of brotherhood. It was no doubt possible to establish human relationships anywhere in the world, but what could explain the special property of the special way in which he considered Chinese, Iranian, and Egyptian Muslims to be his very own? Maybe Sharkar answered, India, I cannot remember the four corners of that vast country, let me speak of Bengal, or Bengal is not just Hindustan, it is also Muslimanstan. From a historical perspective, Hindustan was the land of Hindus, Parsis, Jains, Christians, Sikhs, and Muslims. But for all practical purposes, in the Bengali mind, Bharat Varsha was Hindu Muslim Stan. In a lyrical passage, Sarkar went on to describe how from their birth, Hindu friends played with Muslim friends and children of both faiths grew up together. After that, in bazaars, shops and markets, in grazing pastures and agricultural fields, in religious fairs and religious practices, in festivities and in distress, in famines and in cemeteries, Muslims were companions of Hindus and Hindus were companions of Muslims. The blood and breath of Hindus and Muslims were inextricably linked. The bond forged by this companionship, dwelling together and brotherhood, Sarkar believed was unbreakable. Cerebral reasoning, philosophical discourses and historical scholarship might reveal the relationship of Hindus and Buddhists, as well as Parsis and Vedics. But could discoveries of the head, Sarkar asked, create the chains of enchantment strung by the pulls of the heart? How could Buddhists hope to find the place that Muslims occupied in the Bengali Hindu's heart? Long before the slogan, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai was raised in the 1950s, Sarkar gave a particular spin to the precise nature of this brotherhood. He considered China to be India's Mashir Bari, the home of the mother's sister. The final chapter of Sarkar's travelogue was devoted to an interpretation of political revolution in China. Kang Yuwei was for him China's Ram Mohan Roy, even though he and Prince Ito Hirobhumi of Japan came half a century after Roy. The time lag could be easily explained. The nose of India, Sarkar wrote, protrudes into the vast Indian Ocean. Naturally, India was the first Asian country to have to negotiate European modernity. Kang was born in Guangdong, China's Bengal, and was fortunate to have excellent students, notably Liang Qichiao. Pioneering the comparative study, of Chinese and Indian empires, Sarkar queried young China's terminology that characterized the anti-Manchu Republican Revolution of September 1911 as anti-foreign. It was a politically expedient move that did not gel with historical reality. 
Sarkar drew an interesting parallel between the Mongol and Manchu empires of China and the Afghan and Mughal empires of India. As with the Holy Roman Empire in Europe and the Mughal Empire in India, in China also, the de facto independence of the provinces and the formal vassals was never regarded as inconsistent with the de jure imperium of the Huangti Sarvabhoma or world sovereign. China, quite as much as India, was a pluralistic universe in spite of the fundamental unity of cultural ideas pervading the entire area. Just as the rule of the Muslim sovereigns in India was not an alien rule, so also the rule of the Mongols and the Manchus in China was not a foreign rule. The search for new imaginations of Asia was matched by efforts to turn the continent into a connected field of political resistance to Western imperialism. Exactly at the same time as Binoy Sharkar made his voyage across the Pacific in May 1915 for his scholarly exploration of Japan and China, a Bengali revolutionary, Dash Bihari Bose, was finding his way from Calcutta in search of political refuge in Japan. The Ghadar global network of revolutionaries stretched from the west coast of the United States through Berlin and Istanbul to myriad port cities in Asia. Lala Lajpat Rai was in Japan in the latter half of 1915 after his visits to the United States and Turkey. Lajpat Rai and Rashbi Haribos were befriended by Shumei Okawa, who had been inspired by Okakura's books to take forward the Asianist cause. Another Indian revolutionary, Narendranath Bhattacharya, traveling under the assumed names, Reverend C.A. Martin and Mr. White, had been trying to arrange arms shipments since April 1915 from Batavia and Manila to Bengal and Eastern India. Martin then traveled to Japan where he met Rashbi Haribos and Sunyat Sen. Upon arrival in San Francisco next month, he was taken under the wings of Dhangopal Mukherjee at Stanford, who suggested that he change his name to the humanistic and casteless Manobindranath Roy or MN Roy. Robindranath Tagore's visit to Japan, postponed since August 1915, eventually began on May 29, 1916. As he disembarked the Tosamaru in Kobe, his Japanese friends, led by the painter Yokoyama Taikan, was on hand to welcome him. Japanese beauty and hospitality charmed Tagore. He was impressed with the sparse quality of Japanese art and poetry. Tagore made it a point to visit Okakura's home and was warmly received by his family. Japan's expedition on the path of nationalistic imperialism worried and repulsed Tagore. What is dangerous for Japan, Tagore declared, is not the imitation of the outer features of the West, but the acceptance of the motive force of Western nationalism as her own. Yune Noguchi observed that the large audience listening to Tagore's rebuke of China for embracing the tenets of European nationalism was distinctly divided into two opinions. Tagore criticized not only Japan, but the spirit of extermination that was showing its fangs in another manner in California, Canada and Australia by inhospitably shutting out aliens through those who themselves were aliens in the lands they now occupy. Within days of the poet's departure, a young Indian revolutionary from the United States arrived in Japan by the Tanyo Maru on September 11th, 1916. Tarok Nath Das immediately got in touch with Rashbihari Bose and Sunyat Sen to explore the possibility of arms shipments from China to India. His efforts on that front did not bear fruit, but he achieved more success as a public intellectual than as a secret revolutionary. In March 1917, Das published from Shanghai a short book titled, Is Japan a Menace to Asia? 
Bang Shaoyi, former prime minister of the Chinese Republic, wrote an introduction in which he endorsed Das's conclusion that Japan was a menace to European aggression in Asia. Several variants of Asian universalism were articulated during World War I. For Indian and Chinese revolutionaries, Japan was a base or a refuge for political action. Among scholars and intellectuals, Binay Kumar Sharkar had come to Japan and China mainly to learn, while Tagore journeyed to Japan and the United States primarily to teach his ethics of the imperative to rise above the nation. The poet philosopher was not always able to navigate his way around the pitfall of making an East-West or Asia versus Europe dichotomy. It was Sarkar who set about dismantling the comparative sociology of knowledge that during the 19th century had constructed the Orient as the inferior other of the Occident. Sharkar's first essay titled The Futurism of Young Asia in a book bearing that name, published from Berlin in 1922, was initially delivered as a lecture in the United States in February 1917 and printed as an article in the International Journal of Ethics from Chicago in July 1918. It supplied the lead motive for the entire volume, namely war against colonialism in politics and against Orientalism in science. How could political and military triumphs of Europe and Asia, lasting no more than a century and a half, entitled the sociologist to propagate the jingo cult of difference between the East and the West? That was, in Sarkar's considered view, the first question in the critical philosophy of young Asia. A systematic malapplication of the comparative method by researchers had turned Asia into a synonym for immorality, sensuousness, ignorance, and superstition. Young Asia does not want sympathy or charity, Sarkar declared. The demand of young Asia is justice, a justice that is to be interpreted by itself on the achievements of its own heroes. Dwelling on the, quote, fallacies of neoliberalism, unquote, Sarkar warned Asians not to believe in Western goodwill. He accused Western liberals of being ignorant of the conditions of foreign commerce and empire in Asia. How could they forget the fact that justice in home politics has ever gone hand in hand with injustice and tyranny abroad? His clarion call to cosmopolitanism was grounded on the principle of race equality in international relations. He stated the demand of young Asia in unequivocal terms. The new Asia wants the new Europe and the new America to admit in principle that their peoples must not by any means command greater privileges in the Orient than the Oriental peoples can possibly possess within the bounds of the Occident. The doctrine of international reciprocity is the first article of faith in the gospel of young Asia. Young Asia wants Euro-America to realize that democratic emotions and ideals are not the monopoly of Occidental race psychology. Sarkar's theorizing of Asia as a concept on par with Europe was conducted in the metropolitan centers of what he called Euro-America. It was distilled out of the experience of travel and study across Asia and beyond during World War I. In the immediate aftermath of that cataclysmic conflict, the idea of Asia propounded by anti-colonial thinkers and activists would have to contend and come to terms with other universalisms of both the religious and secular assortments from Khilafat to communism. But that is the history of the next decade and must be left for another day. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Bruce. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I learned so much from it. Um, uh, I invite the, the audience now to put their questions in the question and answer box given in here. And um, well, maybe I can start with a question just to get the discussion started. Uh, I, was, I was really fascinated by a whole range of very insightful uh, observations from um, uh, Sarkar's uh, uh, journeys that you've made. And uh, one thing that I was uh, thinking constantly was that we've had been, I mean, so we've been given this model from Partha Chatterjee's, uh, you know, sort of identification of the late 19th century nationalist elite mind of the inside and the outside, of the inside cultural and the outside where the West is um, dominant. And uh, we tend to often uh, sort of uh, understand many other intellectual elites also through that frame. But what was very fascinating over here was that there was a very different process going on of, of um, uh, selecting various ingredients from various parts. Particularly fascinating was him thinking about a labor regime without uh, of the discipline of the West without the heirs of the West. And so I was wondering if you are also sort of seeing over here the, the development of a different model for understanding um, uh, the nationalist intellectual elite of the time uh, that, that does, that's quite different from the one that uh, Professor Chatterjee had given. Uh, yes, um, uh, I have uh, uh, always contested uh, Bhartha Chatterjee's uh, you know, classification of an inner spiritual uh, and an outer material domain of the state. And he contested Benedict Anderson only partially. Uh, he uh, asked, you know, if um, Asians and Africans simply pirated models that had already been crafted in America and Europe, what did they have left to imagine? And his answer was that they did uh, have an autonomy in what he called an inner uh, spiritual domain. Um, now, I think there are conceptual as well as empirical difficulties uh, with that uh, formulation. And, uh, you know, empirically, I find as I delve into the history of political ideas in Asia in the early 20th century, there was a contestation precisely in the material domain of the state. You know, I had some years ago published an essay on Aurobindo titled Spirit and Form of an uh, uh, Ethical Polity. And so, um, and as you could see, I didn't go into Tagore very much, but if, you know, if you look at his uh, lectures on nationalism in, uh, in uh, Japan and the United States, he's basically you know, rejecting uh, the model of territorial nationalism in, in the West. So yes, um, I am um, uh, trying to offer a different perspective on anti-colonial nationalist thought and some uh, and one that does not lead to the telos of uh, gaining power uh, at uh, at the helm of a uh, you know post colonial uh, nation state but you know these were alternative possibilities for the future which may in fact have lost out at the formal moment of political decolonization but they remain creative and they uh, remain as even possible you know, alternatives uh, in the present, uh, which is why the work that I'm doing is, I would argue, uh, not just of, uh, uh, of, of academic uh, interest. And there's a constant engagement uh, with, uh, with ideas that are circulating in, in Europe and the West, but even more important are the conversations that were taking place across Asia which are not often highlighted. Thank you so much, Professor Bruce. Uh, let me take a few questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is from Tom Wilkinson, who is a PhD student at London School of Economics. Um, his question, and I, I'm reading it out, uh, why exactly was Asia young, young in quotes, following the First World War? And is it only vis-a-vis -vis a more mature Western world? Does it make sense that Asia was again invested with meanings of, in quotes, youthhood following imperialism, and again in the 1990s and even today? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very, very fine uh, question. And um, well, what I would uh, say is that um, 
in fact, in Binoy Kumar Sharka's way of thinking, um, even Euro America was young or new, as he put it. Um, if, if you just recall the last quotation that I read from him about uh, you know new America and new Europe uh, must you know accept the demands of new Asia. Uh, what he was getting at was that um, modernity was new and young everywhere, but as he put it, Occidental scholars were making the false claim. Uh, as if these attributes of modernity attached to Europe, America for all time. And that was sort of a, a historical. But I think he was also using the Bengali terms, uh, Nobin uh, and, uh, and Young in, in English, uh, because he was wanting to suggest that this would be a youthful taking back of what had been lost, but not lost for very long. He was absolutely clear that this was a matter of just about a century, going back to the second or third decades of the 19th century. And for him, 1905 was an important uh, temporal thresholds, not just because of the fact of that uh, um, you know, outcome of a military conflict between Japan and Russia, but based on how the younger generation in the rest of Asia responded to that event. I think it's in those senses that, you know, he was, you know, talking about, you know, young Asia, uh, and he was basically envisioning a global future in which young Asia would have some authorship. Thank you, Professor Burs. The next question is from Professor Usha Iyer, uh, who's a professor in film studies at Stanford. Uh, and I'm um, reading out the question. Thank you, Professor Vos, for this rich laying out of inter Asia connections during this period. Does Sarkar discuss how caste and gender structures translate or not between India and Japan, for instance? I'm curious if he makes observations on women in Japan or China and whether caste comes up as an important differentiating factor in these imagi imaginations of other universalisms. You know, uh, uh, that is in some ways a lacuna in Sarkar, uh, that he does not uh, directly uh, broach uh, the question of caste. I mean, he does when he writes about the United States in the same way that, let's say, Alala Lajpat Rai, in his uh, book, The United States of Asia, makes certain comparative remarks about race in the United States and caste uh, in, uh, uh, in, in India. But interestingly, the question of uh, uh, caste uh, does not you know, come up in any uh, direct way uh, in his uh, uh, writings on, uh, on, on Japan and, uh, uh, Japan and uh, China. Um, uh, gender figures, but not in, you know, a, a, a very uh, direct way. It's in some ways generation that figures much more. Uh, in some ways, Tagore, I think, addresses the question of gender uh, much more uh, directly uh, on his uh, visits to, to, to Japan and China. But thank you for the, for the question. I think, uh, you know, uh, your question suggests uh, perhaps a, a somewhat more critical sort of reading of, uh, uh, of, of, of Sarkar, what's left out and what's, uh, what's highlighted. Thank you, Professor Bruce. Um, there are a few more questions and I'm trying to uh, get to them. Um, uh, I don't have a, a sort of a name over here, but uh, this question says, within the last decade or so, the field of global intellectual history has been particularly vibrant in South Asian studies and many different models of how to study global spread of ideas have been pr uh, proposed. Can you reflect a bit on method? How do you see your work speaking to the field of global intellectual history? Now, uh, uh, there have been um, uh, many, many strands of uh, global intellectual history, particularly among those who uh, have been writing about uh, Asian 
uh, thinkers uh, and, and intellectuals. And uh, I have uh, uh, had an opportunity of, in some ways, being somewhat of a part of different strands of thinking about intellectual history. Uh, so, for example, when I mentioned my uh, essay uh, on uh, Aurobindo, uh, it was very much written in response to an uh, invitation um, uh, that, that came uh, from Cambridge, and that became a, a special issue in modern intellectual history. And that was about the time that uh, uh, my dear uh, friend, the late Christopher Bailey, uh, was writing his uh, writing his book on uh, on liberalism, um, but uh, even though I took part in that project, I think uh, um, my approach was uh, somewhat different, and it probably um, made its appearance first in uh, in a book that I jointly edited uh, with my former student and now distinguished colleague in the Academy, Chris Manjapra, Cosmopolitan Thought Zones, uh, in where you know. First of all, you know, it was Chris's term, uh, well, uh, he was talking about a phronesis, sort of talking in terms of the equality of stature that we must accord uh, to, you know, thought in colonized Asia and, and Africa uh, and in Europe. So my approach is very much one uh, that is aligned with, you know, that, you know, particular approach. It is certainly far more critical uh, of, uh, of liberalism, particularly the liberalism of empire, than was evident, for example, in Chris Bailey's book. And for those of you who are interested, um, I think in the journal Britain and the World, there was an exchange between me and uh, Chris Bailey, which in some ways uh, uh, delineates uh, our differences of emphasis. Uh, in and and our approaches to global intellectual history. Thank you, Professor Pert. Uh, the next question is from uh, Professor Priya Sathya from uh, the Department of History uh, here at Stanford. Um, and I'm reading out the question. Thank you, Professor Bose, and it's good to see you. I was curious what a thought of, uh, no, curious what you thought of the concept of underground Asia in your examination of Indian travelers to Japan and China. A figure like Das may be thought of as part of that world, but not someone like Tagore. Is there a different way you might frame these connections to encompass both under and overground dialogues? Uh, yes, uh, and of course, uh, in this uh, uh, connection, I think it's uh, uh, really important to cite uh, Tim Harper's uh, wonderful uh, new book, uh, underground uh, Asia, uh, and uh, it, it, you're absolutely right that, um, uh, you know, there is a kind of lived cosmopolitanism or uh, a kind of uh, uh, subaltern uh, Asian universalism uh, that you see uh, being portrayed, uh, particularly in Tim Harper's book, in the various uh, port cities uh, dotting the uh, the eastern uh, uh, the, the eastern indian ocean and uh, and again uh, i think uh, if you uh, make a distinction between the so called overground as uh, priya is putting it ideologues and underground um, you know uh, thinkers um, part of the reason why i think sunia sen succeeded in his politics uh, he also had Asian universalist ideas, why he became the founder of Republican China, uh, rather than Kang Yuwei, who couldn't get along with Sun Yat-sen, or Liang Qiqiao, uh, who was a very, very creative thinker, was that in some ways Sun Yat-sen was able to connect uh, his uh, you know, ideas with the subaltern politics of the overseas Chinese. Uh, in places like Penang and other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. So as we think of the movement from, you know, political ideas of universalism, uh, Asian universalism, which emerge in the first decade of the 20th century, to a closer tie up with, you know, political 
action in the second decade of the 20th century. And then, you know, a period of competing multiple, but also overlapping universalisms, you know, Asian, you know, communist internationalism, Islamic universalism in the 1920s. I think uh, we are able to then, you, you know, draw the connections between overground and underground Asia and see who were the figures who were better able to forge uh, these, you know, uh, uh, these connections in the uh, in, in the interwar period. Uh, but I would still say that Vinay Sharkar is interesting. He's not, um, you know, he's somewhere between <laughs> Tagore uh, and uh, Tarok Nath Das. But for a figure like Vinay Kumar Sharkar through his writings between 1914 and 1925 certainly provide some intellectual foundation for the political actions resorted to by underground Asia. So in a sense that he does provide a link between overground and underground, I would argue. Uh, thank you, Professor Burst. Uh, uh, we, uh, we will take one more question, one last question from uh, Barun Mitra. While, uh, the question is, while searching for the underlying unity in Asia, how did Sarkar look at Japan's colonization of Korea and the Republican Revolution in China? Um, yeah, uh, again, uh, Sarkar, as you know, uh, as I mentioned, he he did see Korea uh, as something of, uh, you know, for Japan in, in the way that Ireland was a colony of, uh, uh, of England. Uh, so he, uh, you know, understood and recognized that, uh, that unfreedom. But there were many intellectuals in that period whether it was Binoy Sharkar or Taruk Nath Das, or among the Chinese, uh, Tang Xiaoyi, who wrote an introduction to Taruk Nath Das's book, or much late, later, W.E.B. Du Bois, who visited um, Japan and China in the 1930s, they sort of basically came to the conclusion that, um, I mean, they were giving Japan something of a pass, uh, uh, at least before the invasion of mainland China in 1937, by suggesting that, you know, Japan's colonization of Korea and even its aggression in uh, China before 1937 uh, was, in a sense, to be explained away uh, as warding off uh, a European takeover of, of these places. So, you know, that was the um, kind of position that they took. Now, but Binay Kumar Sharkar is much more nuanced and much more insightful when he comes to his, uh, uh, his discussion of Republican China. In fact, I had to, I realized that I was going over time and I had to skip over what I wanted to say about Binay Kumar Sharkar on, on political revolution uh, in China. He is very astute and he takes on uh, young China saying that, uh, you know, that they are making a mistake both in terms of thinking about the Manchus as foreign. And I gave some glimpse of what he was, uh, you know, arguing uh, in that respect. But he was also uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, insightful in suggesting that, you know, perhaps the kind of unification that Republican China was seeking was not uh, the type that you know, China necessarily needs or, or, or requires. And this, I think he was able to argue uh, because of his experience in India. And again, that's a strand in Indian political thought, which probably has not been highlighted as much, that most creative thinkers uh, thought of some kind of a federal India and in the case of Binay Kumar Sharkar, he was even making an argument for a federal China that earlier empires perhaps knew better how to balance center with, with region than we seem to be able to do in this age of nationalism and republicanism. Thank you, Professor. Well, there are many other questions, but I'll take just one final, final one. <laughs> Sorry about this. I thought the last one was final. Um, uh, thank you for this. This is from Meghna Chaudhary. Thank you for this wonderful tour through Sarkar's actual and intellectual uh, travels in this period. I'm curious 
how you would relate these writings coming out of Sarkar's interactions with Japan or China um, as the articulation of anti-colonial critique with his writings around national capital in India in the interwar period. Specifically, he comes to the conclusion at one point around perhaps 1926 that Indian industrialists or businesses simply did not have the access to capital and thus investments required to build up the nation. He then seems to be articulating an argument about anti-colonial nationalism as one that required young, in quotes, India's apprenticeship to foreign capital investments in India. You know, um, there are different phases uh, in, um, you know, Binar Sharkar's uh, intellectual trajectory. He is constantly on the move uh, from 1914 to 1926. Um, and he's all over the place in, you know, set in Ch China, Japan, but also uh, then in Germany, the United States, and, and so forth. And then after being professor of political economy at Calcutta University, uh, he becomes somewhat sedentary. And of course, he's a, an economics professor at Calcutta University. And so his writings of that later period take on uh, a, a, a somewhat sort of different emphasis of the sort that uh, uh, Make Natural Theory is, uh, uh, is suggesting. Uh, so I, I was, um, you know, basically taking, you know, uh, Binay Sharkar, uh, the, the mobile, uh, you know, uh, thinker, uh, rather than the one who then is talking about um, Indian pol political economy, uh, you know, assessing capital requirements, whether indigenous capital would be sufficient or not, should, uh, should India be open to uh, foreign capital investments and so on. I don't know what he would have made of, uh, you know, post-independence uh, uh, India, because he once more became mobile in 1949 and traveled to the United States uh, after a long gap, but then he died in uh, Washington, uh, Washington DC. Uh, so I think that uh, as in the case of different phases of an artist, we, we need to distinguish between the different phases of the thinking of Abhinay Kumar Sharkar as well. Thank you, Professor Bose. I invite Lalita now to take over. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just want to, on behalf of everyone at the Center for South Asia at Stanford, and also on behalf of our co-sponsors, the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford and the Institute for South Asia Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. I just want to thank our speaker, Professor Bose. Thank you so much. Uh, and also our wonderful moderator, Professor Parchil. Uh, thank you all for attending and please uh, follow us on social media or sign up for our mailing list so you can find out about all our events and we hope to see you again very, very soon. Thank you.